You are listening to Love Your Practice with Dr. Laura Mock. I'm a general dentist, a practice owner, and a certified life coach. I teach women who own dental practices to lead with intention and literally fall in love with their businesses. Keep listening and you will see how learning to love your practice turns into loving your life too. Well, hi there. Welcome back to another episode of my podcast. I'm Dr. Laura Mock. And just before we get started on today's episode, I want to announce that I am holding my first ever live webinar. And it is on the subject of how to love your practice by changing only one simple thing. And I'd love to see you there. The easiest way to find it from where you are right now inside my podcast is to open up a browser and go to loveyourpractice.net and you'll see my face on there. And then if you scroll down just a little bit more, you'll see a link that says register for free webinar. I'd love to see you there. We're already a third full, you guys. I can only host a hundred people and there's already, as of today is February 6th, we have 30 people registered. So if you want in on that registration, you stop what you're doing, go register, and then come back and listen to this podcast. Okay. Now, I want to welcome you to today's episode. I had a fascinating interview with our guest today. Her name is Dr. Jessica Metcalf, and she is a lovely person, plus she's a general dentist for cancer patients, and she's an imposter syndrome and empowerment coach. She lives in Toronto, Canada, and every dentist, especially every female dentist, can really benefit from listening to her message. So we found each other on Instagram, and we were like, uh, hey, we are talking about very similar things. We should do a podcast. So that's what we did, and I am so excited for you to hear what she has to say today, so keep on listening. This podcast is slightly longer than normal. I think it's 25 minutes after the interview starts but it's well worth listening to the very end. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on the other side. Okay, and I would just like to welcome to my podcast, Dr. Jessica Metcalf. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I know. I'm so glad we carved out some time to chat and to to talk about what you do because it's really amazing. I think it can make a difference for a lot of dentists, especially maybe female dentists. Definitely. Most definitely. Yeah. So you are a general dentist, right? That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you treat exclusively cancer patients. Is that right? That is correct. So Mm -hmm. I work out of a cancer center. Mm -hmm. So patients are already diagnosed when they're coming to see me. They are being referred to me by their oncologist. And so uh, our main types of patients that we see are the head and neck cancers pre, during, and post-radiation, and then the leukemias and the lymphomas before they go for their bone marrow or stem cell transplant. So essentially, we're getting them ready, making sure they're infection-free before they go through that treatment. And then we kind of dabble in a little uh, of the other cancers, so breast, prostate, lung, but that's more so on an emergency basis if things present themselves while they're undergoing treatment. So when you tell me all that, I'm like, holy crap, she's done it. She's amazing. She's at the zenith of her career. But what's interesting is that's not why we're talking to you today. (laughs) (laughs) Because you're also an imposter syndrome and empowerment coach. Yes. So tell me what happened there because you were already amazing and then you became more amazing. So just tell me your story. (laughs) So I didn't realize what was happening. And when people ask me, how did you know, like what point in time did you start to experience the imposter syndrome, um, also known as the imposter phenomenon? And I don't think there was one specific point. It's been an addition of events that have happened over the course of my life, which got me to a point where I was in my third burnout and I needed to get myself out of it. And I stumbled across um, a reading of Lean In by uh, Sheryl Sandberg. Mm -hmm. And it just briefly touched on imposter syndrome in there. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like, this sounds part of what I'm going through. And I like 
took a deep dive into the imposter phenomenon and started to realize what I was doing to myself that overworking to prevent and predict mistakes, underestimating my abilities and explaining away my successes. And because of that, I then created this limiting belief system and self-sabotaging behavior that I knew I needed to get out of. Otherwise, I wasn't going to last the next 20, 25 years in dentistry. And so what I started to do was start to do my own research. And I started to essentially heal myself because I was like, okay, well, what is actually happening? And so what I had noticed is from previously, my experiences was, so say for instance, when I got into dental school, I felt like I actually shouldn't be there. I felt like they were going to find out. And I remember being in orientation week and getting there on my first day finding that chair I even like I remember the feeling of the chair thinking okay I need to hide among everyone because they're going to get to the letter m's and they're going to say we got to send her back packing or packing back to Canada because we made a mistake she shouldn't actually be here and it was partly because I was waitlisted originally and then got into one dental school and that was it and I kept telling myself okay, well, it, th there's no way that this actually happened. It wasn't because of me and all of my hard work. And I struggled in undergrad because I had three major life-defining moments. One being I was diagnosed with a learning disability in second year in my undergraduate degree. So I had to learn how to learn all over again. And so little pieces along the way, I had created this inner dialogue that was so negative and I needed to change that. And so when I started to talk more about the imposter phenomenon, I realized that I wasn't alone in thinking this and that other women were out there experiencing the exact same thing, but no one wanted to talk about it because everyone felt embarrassed or ashamed. Well, yeah, because if you feel embarrassed or ashamed, then that emotion is going to drive you to hide. Exactly. So then we're all feeling embarrassed and ashamed together and we're in our little turtle shell, not seeing other people feeling the same way. We think we're the only one who sucks. Exactly. That's exactly it. And when I started to kind of just dabble, because it's hard in the beginning because you don't know who you can trust. You don't know if someone else is going to use your story against you, right? Yeah. And so initially I started to kind of just drop a little thing being like, hey, do you ever feel like you get this like anxiety before like certain procedures or even you see a, a difficult patient's name show up on your schedule like a week in advance and that entire week leading up to it, you just get this like pit in your stomach and how do you deal with it? And so I started to ask and the responses that I was getting from other women also then helped me as well in the sense that I'm like, okay, so this isn't me. I'm not alone in this. We're not talking about this. So we're each in our own turtle shell, suffering on our own. And I'm like, I can't, I, I don't want this. To, I, don't, I don't want this anymore. I don't want this for me. I don't want this for other women. Mm -hmm. And so I started to share more about my story. I started to share more about my client's story. And what I was noticing is all of a sudden now women were coming together and supporting each other and embracing the fact that, yeah, there are times where we have self-doubt, but it doesn't need to consume us. It doesn't need to consume us. And a lot of times what we're worrying about is actually not even accurate or true. Exactly. We just have a habit of thinking it. Yes. And those habits start when we're really young. Yeah. Like so a couple of, or even younger. Yeah. So part of one of the questions that I get is, well, when did the imposter phenomenon start? And so there's a couple of different dimensions that lead up to it. One of them being our childhood experiences. So intelligence may have been highly valued in your household where you're saying, where you heard, okay, got to get the next, you only got 97%, where's that extra 3%? Or you got to keep achieving or what's the next goal, right? The other aspect of it is you may have experienced a traumatic childhood. 
-hmm. but we're not playing the blame game. It's just understanding, okay, where did those thoughts initially start and how did they make their way into today? And then there's society's expectations of women in general, <laughs> right? Where we get this, so cognitive dissonance where we have two conflicting views trying to occur at the exact same time and our brain can't unwind them. So one of the things that I like to talk about a lot, especially in my master classes, is women are told, so say for instance, the beauty industry, there's the anti-aging, there's Botox, there's the fitness fads, there's the detox teas. But if you care too much, you're considered vain and high maintenance. Right. Right. So what, tell me more about this, um, what we pick up from society. So you said there's the beauty industry. But what is it that makes me feel embarrassed to talk to a group of physicians or um, not sure that someone's really going to want my best treatment? You know, like what is it to connect me from society's messages to that feeling of anxiety when I'm trying to be heard? So a paper had come out, I think it was in 94, where it was looking at the culture of medicine and dentistry and pharmacy and nursing, that high achieving competitive admission process where it initially was you trying to get in, you were one among the top performers. Mm -hmm. Then you got in and now it's normalized, right? You're among all of the top performers. And because of that, we then created this culture where asking for help shouldn't actually exist because we should actually have all that information already. Okay. And so what ends up happening is, is that that then leads into whether we do a residency into practice, into owning an office where we're extremely capable individuals and we should have that information. And so then what happens is then you don't necessarily want to ask for help for fear of being found out or for that fear of feeling stupid. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I shouldn't have to ask because I'm the doctor. Exactly. I shouldn't have to have problems with this big giant MODBL because it's my job to make the contacts you know, fit and to make the embrasures nice. And I shouldn't, sh they notice that word should, I should not have to whatever. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's dangerous. Exactly. And that's when you hit the nail on the head where it's, we should be able to. And so our thought processes is as we go through different transitional periods in our life, we get taken out of our comfortable zone and put into something that's uncomfortable. And that's when it tends to arise the most. So what ends up happening, look at graduation. A week prior, someone checked our radiograph, someone checked our prep, someone checked our restoration, right? And then all of a sudden you're given your degree and you're told, I have to do this all on my own now. <laughs> like where, where did that shift end up happening, right? Or you're then, an associate maybe at a couple of different offices and different principal dentists want you doing things a different way, right? Or you then go into buying an office and in dental school, yeah, we're taught how to be dentists, but we're not taught necessarily the business side of it. No. <laughs> so now we're, now we're starting from scratch and trying to figure out, okay, how do I run this business? And it can then even lead us or go right into retirement where I was speaking to someone who retired. And the thought is you've been achieving, 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 achieving. Now what? Yeah. Like the achieving was telling you you're okay. And now you're done achieving. So. Yeah. And so what happens is then we end up linking our self-worth to our achievements, mm -hmm. right? So I'm worthy if I'm successful. Yes. I'm worthy if I have this much production. I'm worthy if I make this much money, yes. right? And we need to remember that our worth as a human being is not dictated by how many achievements we keep on achieving or have achieved at this point. Yeah. So that kind of transitions because what you've done so far is you've established very well that most of us... <laughs> 
have at least some bit of imposter syndrome floating around in our brain. Mm -hmm. And it feels really nice to just know that I'm 100% not alone in those self-doubt feelings that I have and in my brain taking me down a ride of like, you're probably not good enough and someone's going to find out that you suck or, you know, that type of Mm -hmm. thing. It's really, really nice to just acknowledge that that's happening and that it happens to the best of us. Mm -hmm. But what else do you teach people to get out of it? How can I be comfortable in my own skin again? Yeah. It's making yourself aware Mm -hmm. of as those thoughts start to come up. And so there's 10 different styles of unhelpful, unhelpful thinking. So cognitive distortions. Mm -hmm. And so one of them is even looking through that list of 10 and you can Google it to find and seeing which ones resonate with you. And so one in particular is say, for instance, a mental filter. And so the way to look at it is if you have a prism and you have light shining through. And as that light shines through, you see a rainbow of light on the other side. So all the different colors. But what a mental filter does in the imposter phenomenon is that initial light goes through. And in that prism, all of your successes, your wins, your transferable skills, all the positives that just went into succeeding get stuck. And all you see is that one light that comes out are the negatives what went wrong, the mistakes that ended up happening, right? And so trying to figure out maybe which cognitive distortion you might be experiencing allows you to become aware. So then as that thought starts to come up, you essentially look at it, reflect on it and try to change it. And it's hard. It's not easy, right? It's very easy for our brain to slip back into that negative thought pattern because we've done that this entire time. And so now it's being aware and making a conscious effort to change those thoughts. I was just speaking with someone where even outside of dentistry, it had that perfectionism had flown into. So meditation, she's like, I know I should be meditating. My family meditates, my friends meditate. My mom who has chronic pain meditates and has found that it has helped. She's like, but I can't seem to make it work. She goes, I can't stop the thoughts that are happening or the chatter that's happening in my brain. And I said, okay, but what if you had the understanding that your brain is supposed to keep on working, right? Your brain are supposed to have those thoughts. Mm -hmm. So what if the next time you went to meditate, you know that that's your still time and allowing yourself to think whatever, but then when you notice it kind of takes off, you're saying, okay, I'm going to bring it back to where I am right now. Mm -hmm. So it's giving yourself permission to be able to meditate the way that it works for you. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to stop you there because this is really interesting. So we're talking about metacognition right now, Mm -hmm. right? We're talking about thinking about what we're thinking And I think it's really helpful, like what you said, to kind of acknowledge that our brains are wired to be negative. Like that filter process that you were describing, that's Mm. just your brain trying to be helpful. (laughs) It's trying. (laughs) It doesn't really understand 21st century Western society. It's operating as if we're on the savannah. (laughs) Yes. Yes. It's true. So it's, it's wired to be negative because it's, um, it's trying to keep us safe, find the potential problems, right? But what I find is that when my clients realize through metacognition that their brains are taking them through this negative filter, that sometimes they can get angry at their brain. They could be like, stop it, brain. You know, like we need to quit doing this. This is not the way it's supposed to happen. But what I find is that's completely unhelpful. We have to accept that our brains are our human brains and they're just doing what they do. Mm -hmm. Once you do that and give your brain a little bit of grace, then it's so much easier to redirect your thoughts. You see that you've been negative. 
in however way, way you're doing that, whether it's meditation or what I call a thought download, where you just write down whatever you're thinking, mm-hmm. or however you do it, you see the negative thoughts and you go, oh, huh, I see what my brain is doing here, but mm-hmm. I am choosing to look at the whole spectrum of light and I'm going to look at the good things that I have done as well. Yeah. It's hard to acknowledge those positives, right? Yes, it is, because it's, it's not natural. Exactly. That's exactly it. And one of the exercises that I get my clients to do is over the course of an entire week, and it only takes about five minutes each day is you write down your achievements, but any achievements, because that's where the imposter phenomenon kicks in is we only think those life defining achievements are acceptable, Mm -hmm. right? We forget all those other achievements, like picking up the mail today, (laughs) right? Getting, getting out of bed, um, enjoying your cup of coffee and maybe not having to rewarm it up twice because you forgot about it, right? Right. We forget all of those achievements. So the reason why I have people do it over the course of an entire week is because as you experience different emotions, you're going to remember different achievements that have happened throughout your entire life. Maybe you won a chess game really early on against a competitive person when you first started, right? Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the week, what you now need to do is sit down with yourself or stand and you need to read the list out loud Mm -hmm. because by reading it out loud, you are engaging more than one sense and you're committing it to long-term memory. Mm -hmm. That then allows you to accept those achievements as well. Then it's important to ask yourself, what if someone else had done all of these things? What would you think of them as an individual? Because the way that you choose to talk to yourself isn't the way that you would choose to talk to that person who's on that piece of paper. That's so true. That's so true. We're so hard on ourselves. But yeah, I'm just thinking about all the little things, little and big things that I've done in my life. And my brain doesn't make a list of those every day. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Oh, it's like, well, you're thinking about some radiolucent line on a radiograph and that's my fault. Or I didn't really tell Mrs. Jones about her fourth option for her missing tooth or, you know, like my brain is always going through the things that I didn't do right. So that's a great awareness exercise. I had a student recently ask me, they're like, what ends up happening? Like, how do you acknowledge or appreciate what's happening in your career, those little wins? And I said, one in particular, and you won't notice this until you're a year out or even six months out and you retake a bite wing or you're looking at taking a bite wing. And instead of looking at that radiolucency, you think that contact, (laughs) those margins, that's good. (laughs) Right? Like just as often as you're like, okay, that radiolucency is there. Okay. I either need to watch it or change it out for those good ones. You need to congratulate yourself because no one else is going to, right? No one else is going to be congratulating you. No one's giving you hundred percent on a test anymore. Right? right? You need to find that internal validation instead of seeking it from getting awards, getting degrees, or however it was labeled in front of you previously. Yes, that's so true. Nobody, the hygienist, the front desk, they're not looking at that nice emergence profile. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're like, damn, that looks good. <laughs> I made that. Yeah. Okay. And I just want to point out because this is so important. What you're talking about affects more than your sense of Mm well-being because our thoughts are where everything begins. It's a cascade effect where our thoughts create our reality Mm -hmm. because our thoughts create our feelings and our feelings drive our actions and our actions, if we accumulate those, we get our life. So what you're talking about right now, where we're nicer to ourselves, where we give ourselves the credit we deserve, will create 
a feeling of pride or excitement or self-love instead of shame. And we can come out of our turtle shell and we can let the whole world enjoy the things that we are good at and benefit from the things that we're good at. And then it will accumulate to be something more intentional and better for each woman who takes this on. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. So you're out there changing lives. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you a question. If someone's listening to this and they're like, how do I find this woman? <laughs> she is so helpful. She's making me feel <laughs> so good. <laughs> like where did we go on the interwebs to find mm-hmm. you? You can find me at drdrjessicametcalf.com, which is my website. Or if you're on Instagram or LinkedIn, name, put into the search engine and I'll pop up. That's great. You know, Instagram, there's a lot of cool female dentists on Instagram. I really, that's how I found you, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I, it wasn't until COVID when I looked at social media in a very negative light, right? Mm -hmm. So about three years ago, I stayed away from social media for a period of time because everyone was posting in their wedding dresses. Everyone was posting the perfect vacations. Everyone was posting their um, first baby. And I was like, I, I'm like, I can't, I'm, I felt like I was behind in life Mm -hmm. and I felt like everything was perfect and my life wasn't. And I was like, I can't, I can't be on social media anymore. And it wasn't until COVID because we had to isolate. And I was like, okay, I'm going to look at social media in a different way now. And that's when I found this whole other side of it. And I was like, this is incredible. And all of those female Instagram dentists that you're talking about and the influencers and the positivity that's out there, just as you can filter out all of the positives, well, you can also filter out all of the negatives and just see the positives. So. You can. And you know, I just want to say, this is the perfect example because you have changed how you think about something and you Mm -hmm. did that deliberately. And I'm sure that that came as a result of your training and your awareness Mm -hmm. and you changed how you think about it, which changed how you feel, which changed who you're affecting. Yeah. Because now you're out there making a difference for these people. And it's, it started with how you're thinking. Mm-hmm. It's a perfect illustration. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so smart. Is there anything else that you want my listeners to know that can help them, you know, like a nugget or anything, mm-hmm. an easy step into being a little bit more aware of their negative thoughts before we close? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's allowing yourself to also experience it instead of trying to just push it under the rug and hope it goes away because you're telling yourself, I shouldn't be feeling this. Yeah. But sometimes you have to embrace the suck. So then that way you can be fulfilled and experience happiness and joy Mm -hmm. and whatever other positive emotion you want to throw in there. But you do need a little bit of both in order to see the contrast. I definitely agree with that. My coach says that if you're resisting an emotion, it's like trying to hold a beach body, that beach ball underwater. Yeah. Oh, so challenging. (laughs) It will wait for you. (laughs) That ball will wait until you stop pushing it. (laughs) Yeah. Be there for you to feel. So if you could close your eyes and just feel that sucky thing, maybe name it, Mm -hmm. describe it, it will pass much, much easier. Yep. I agree. Yeah. Whereas if we just run away from it and run and run and run and, and do what we call buffering, which is like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to watch this TV show instead, or I'm going to drink this wine so that I can stop feeling this way or whatever, then we're just hurting ourselves. Mm -hmm. Just feel that sucky feeling. Just close your eyes and embrace it. It'll pass faster. Yeah. It's really good. Okay. Well, Dr. Jessica Metcalf, empowerment coach. I like that. Yeah. And I'm so glad that we met. This is going to be great for the listeners. And if anyone wants to learn more about Jessica Metcalf, I will make sure that her website is on our show notes.
Thank you so much again for having me. This has been wonderful. Yes, it's been so fun. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to Love Your Practice with Dr. Laura Mock. I would love to meet you. To join our movement, find the Facebook group called Love Your Practice and request to join. If you can't find it, just send me a message and I'll add you. You'll find me there helping all of my ladies to fall in love with their businesses and have a better life.